Uh, I'll share with you some thoughts about the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, uh, how it started, what its aims are, and how it connects to some of the discussion that's been taking place uh, tonight. Uh, Roosevelt said, a conquest may be fraught with evil or with good for mankind according to the comparative worth of the conquering and conquered peoples, end of quote. So savages fits right there. Um, a very important Zionist thinker, Zaev Jabotinsky, in the pre-state era of, of Zionism, he was uh, the far-right reform Zionism uh, uh, brand of the movement, uh, wrote the following in a very important article titled The Iron Wall. Uh, he wrote, it is utterly impossible to obtain the voluntary consent of the Palestine Arabs for converting Palestine from an Arab country into a country with a Jewish majority. He, he carries on, the native populations, civilized or uncivilized, of course we're not civilized, but regardless, have always stubbornly resisted the colonists, irrespective of whether they were civilized or savage. So in a nutshell, Jabotinsky was basically saying that Zionism has to defeat hope in the colonized nation, the Palestinians, in order to force an agreement on them. You cannot get their consent to accept colonization. No one accepts colonization. People are not stupid, actually, he says. He says those so-called liberal Zionists are very racist. They think Arabs are dumb and we can bribe them. They cannot be bribed. Like any colonized nation, they will resist us. So we've got to kill their hope with massive power. And the Iron Wall strategy of Jabotinsky lives on till today in, in Zionism. But it has taken many shapes, from the concrete wall in the occupied territory to the metaphorical wall that Israel has built in our minds. So some very similar experiences have been shared by the indigenous people of this land, of Canada, and so on. The colonizers succeed when they kill hope in the colonized, and part of doing that is by colonizing our minds and convincing us that we are worthless beings, relative, what I call relative humans, that is, humans only in the relative sense. So you don't deserve the full set of rights because you're not really a full human, uh, uh, and you have no hope in defeating this progress machine, this, this massive power. So you might as well adapt. Up. Uh, we in the Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions movement, which was launched in 2005, felt otherwise. That to resist hopelessness, we've got to have massive hope. But this hope has to be built on a real strategy that can succeed, not wishful thinking. Quite often the oppressed wish oppression away, but that's hardly helpful. Wishing something is okay, so long as you translate that into a strategy so that you understand your reality, you reflect on it, and you act to change it. That's exactly what we did when we launched the Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions movement in 2005, building on a very long heritage of Palestinian resistance to settler colonialism, and building on the experiences of the South African uh, fight against oppression, the civil rights movement in the United States, the anti-colonial struggles in India and many other places around the world, and definitely on the heroism of the indigenous people who survived the genocide in this land. The BDS movement, the Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions movement, launched in 2005, called for three basic rights without which we cannot achieve self-determination. Ending the occupation of 1967, including the wall and the colonies, ending Israel's system of racial discrimination, which meets the United Nations definition of apartheid, and I'll explain that in a minute, and the right of return for Palestinian refugees. Uh, some, someone might ask, why did you insist on all three rights rather than just ending the occupation, which is easier. We all understand that. It's nice to be convenient, but that's not our main concern. Our main concern are the rights of our people. And the Palestinian people, around 11.8 million of us, do not all live in the occupied Palestinian territory of 1967. In fact, only 38% of the Palestinians live in Gaza and the West Bank, including East Jerusalem. 12% are Palestinian citizens of the State of Israel, and a whole 50% are Palestinians in exile, not allowed to go home simply because they're the wrong type. They're not Jewish. 
So any person interested in human rights and is consistent with herself or himself would call for the basic rights of all three communities, not just the most convenient, those living under occupation in the 1967 territory. That's why BDS calls for ending the occupation, ending apartheid, and the right of return for Palestinian refugees. Going back to the issue of apartheid, because it's one of the most controversial issues, people ask us, when you say Israel is guilty of apartheid, on top of being a settler colonial state and an occupying power, which we can discuss or debate, but it's the apartheid uh, uh, crime that sticks out. And people say, are you saying that Israel is identical with South Africa? Palestinians in Israel can vote. Blacks in South Africa could never vote. So they're not the same. And blacks in South Africa were the majority, and Palestinians in Israel are a minority. Some very big intellectuals in this country on the left use this argument uh, uh, to argue that Israel cannot be an apartheid state. But it seems big intellectuals on the left or the right seem to be missing one main reference. I know in the US, international law sounds like Swahili, but to the rest of the world, it, it means something. Uh, international law defines the crime of apartheid. In the 1973 Convention for the Suppression and Punishment of the Crime of Apartheid and in the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, apartheid as a crime is not just a South African crime. It definitely existed in South Africa, but it's a universal crime. You had it in the US, you just did not call it apartheid then. In, in the Jim Crow South, that was very much an apartheid reality. It wasn't called apartheid because apartheid came into existence later. But it's systematic oppression by one racial group against another that is legalized and institutionalized. So racial discrimination alone is not yet apartheid. When it's entrenched, when it's institutionalized in law, when it's legalized, then it becomes apartheid. When you have laws that discriminate against a, a subset of your citizenry based on their identity, that's apartheid. That's exactly what Israel has today. Other than what's, what Israel is doing in the West Bank and Gaza, which is obviously apartheid, within Israel's uh, own supposed borders, Israel has no borders, but within the pre-67 borders of the state of Israel, Israel has more than 50 discriminatory laws that treat its non-Jewish uh, citizens as a second-class citizen. So they get lesser rights by law, not by policy only, by law. And that's the key point. So Israel is a regime of occupation, settler colonialism, as well as apartheid. In, fi in, in fact, President Obama himself kind of recognized that issue. In an interview with Jeffrey Goldberg, he said, in fact, that Israel's, uh, this is a paraphrase of what he told Jeffrey Goldberg, if Israel doesn't disentangle itself from the lives of the West Bank Palestinians, the world will one day decide it is behaving as an apartheid state. John Kerry went further than that, and he explicitly used the term apartheid in 2014, last year, when he said Israel can become an apartheid state like the old South Africa if it did not reach peace with the so-called peace with the Palestinians. Regardless, the rest of the world is, is increasingly recognizing Israel's regime of oppression for what it is. Uh, the issue of apartheid is, is at the forefront of this definition of Israel's regime. In fact, in a couple of weeks, Israeli Apartheid Week is, uh, is, a, is an international event that's happening across campuses around the world, more than 200 cities around the world, that recognizes Israel as an apartheid state. Um, Israel's standing in world public opinion has suffered tremendously for two main factors. One factor is Israel's own regime shifting to the far right and doing away, losing any masks of democracy. Israel was never a democratic state, a, a colonial power that, that practices apartheid, that has laws that discriminate and so can never be a democracy. Yet it had a very compelling mask of democracy and a huge media operation that projected that mask of democracy. With the current far-right Israeli government, they've dropped the mask. So they've helped a lot. And I've said that before and I'll say it again, you've got to give credit where credit belongs. Without Netanyahu, we couldn't have done it this fast. <laughs> a, a BBC 
GlobeScan poll, which is an international public opinion poll, for the last number of years has cons consistently shown Israel competing with North Korea in popularity. On the third or fourth worst perceived country in the world, according to the BBC poll, is Israel. North Korea comes uh, a, a notch lower than that. Uh, and this is not just in countries like Brazil, India, Egypt, uh, you know, the global south that naturally supports Palestinians. This is across Europe. Two-third majorities across Europe's largest nations perceive Israel negatively. Germany, France, Italy, Britain, and, and, and Spain, and so on. In fact, even in the US, not yet a majority, but things are shifting. According to recent polls, a CNN poll a couple of weeks ago, two-thirds of, of Americans believe that the US government should, should be neutral in the so-called Palestinian-Israeli conflict. You wouldn't think so, looking at Congress or reading the mainstream media. Two-thirds want the US to be neutral, neither pro-Israel nor pro-Palestinian. Imagine. Uh, and if you dig deeper into some of those polls in 2014, close to 40% of Americans support sanctions against Israel because of the settlement issue. 40%, four out of 10. <laughs> Among what the poll calls Hispanics, the percentage is highest. It's about 44% of Latino Americans support sanctions against Israel because of the occupation and settlements. Among Jewish Americans, 15% of Jewish Americans support boycott of Israeli products. 25% support boycott of settlement products. But imagine, 15% support a full boycott. That's why JVP is growing. There, there is a constituency there that no longer blindly supports Israel, even among Jewish Americans. That's a very important trend that we must see. Among young Democrats, there are more people supporting Palestinians than supporting Israel. Young Democrats, the Democratic Party, imagine. Hardly Democratic, but that's what they call themselves. <laughs> um, recently, Israel's foreign ministry distributed a paper uh, to its uh, uh, diplomatic missions across the world, saying that 2015 will see even further isolation of Israel. This theme of isolation has been repeating itself for the last couple of years or so. John Kerry threatened Israel that if you don't reach peace, that was last year, with the Palestinians, the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement is around the corner, and it's getting stronger and stronger. He actually said that. Obama hinted at it. He said Israel might face a lot, uh, a, a very uh, uh, fast-growing uh, isolation if it did not reach some settlement with the, with the Palestinians. Um, the Israeli government, since June 2013, started looking at BDS as a strategic threat to its entire regime. Why, someone may ask, is such a nonviolent civil society-based movement such a strategic threat to an, a nuclear power that's supported by the world's only superpower. I mean, Netanyahu, on, in his APAC speech last year, mentioned BDS 18 times, second only to Iran, as the biggest threats facing it. So you would want Iran and its supposed nuclear threat, and BDS are weird. But it's not that strange if you look at Israel's power structure. Yes, Israel is a very powerful country with nuclear weapons. Even economically, it's very powerful, mostly thanks to your tax money, and German tax money, and French, and British, and, and others. Um, yet, Israel's power structure was not designed to face challenges from nonviolent movements like BDS. They don't know what to do with us. So when we pressured Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to sell off their shares in G4S, the largest security company on Earth, because of its involvement in the occupation, what can Israel do? Hijack Bill Gates? I mean, so, so that's, you reach the limit of Israel's power. Really, they cannot face such a challenge. When we convinced the largest pension funds in the world, some of the largest pension funds in the world, in Norway, uh, Luxembourg, the, uh, the Netherlands, to divest from Israeli banks and companies that are involved in the occupation, Israel could do absolutely nothing. When large uh, uh, European corporations decided to abandon uh, uh, contracts to build Israeli uh, ports, 
what can Israel do, and so on and so forth. When student councils across the University of California system and across the country start adopting divestment against Caterpillar, HP, uh, Veolia, and, and so on and so forth, what can Israel do? So we are testing the limits of Israel's power, and we're pushing back against their iron wall that they've built in many of our heads, including in this country. Many in this country believe that this is an animal that you should not touch. You don't mention Israel, you just stay away from that problem, because anything you say, you might lose your job, you might lose your career, you might be isolated. Well, we're proving otherwise. SJPs, Students for Justice in Palestine, super in this campus, and many, many student groups across the country, Jewish Voice for Peace, and many partners are growing tremendously and challenging this hegemonic uh, discourse. Um, we're also see, we, we've also seen a lot of academic and cultural boycott successes in the last few years. Uh, academic associations across the United States have adopted a full academic boycott of Israel, including Native American and Indigenous Studies Association, uh, of course, American Studies Association, and many, many, many others. So it's growing. That has shattered the taboo that you cannot mention even boycotting Israel in this country and get away with it. This is so two years ago. <laughs> Today, life has changed. Today, it's okay. It's very controversial, but it's no longer taboo. It's no longer taboo. Yes, we are calling for a full boycott of Israel, academically, culturally, economically, financially. Uh, Part of what we do is intersectional work, cross-movement work. And I think that's part of the success of the BDS movement. It's not a narrow, nationalistic type of movement that sees Palestinian rights, Palestinian freedom, justice, and equality as out of context, as separate from struggles. Because many people have many other things to worry about. Why should any American who's not in the top 1% worry about Palestine. Why, why should they even be concerned about Palestine? You have so many problems in this country, you don't need me to tell you. Uh, public schools are being shut down, health services, pensions are disappearing, and so on and so forth, while the U.S. can spend hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars killing people, uh, mostly brown people, obviously, across, savages across the world. Uh, for the oil companies and for the homeland security companies and for the military companies and so on. Why? should any American care? Uh, well, there are many reasons. Today, as South African jurist John Dugard said, Palestine has become the litmus test for human rights in today's world. As South Africa was in the 70s and 80s, today it's Palestine. This is the, the, at the front line of our collective struggles against empire, against corporations, against the, the, the pillage of the resources of the world. Second, because it's your tax money, mainly, that has enabled Israel to continue and expand its regime of oppression against the Palestinians, our oppression has made in the USA written all over it. That engenders a responsibility. To offset what your tax money is doing, people have the responsibility to act to end complicity of their unions, their churches, their institutions, and eventually their government in this system of oppression. So there's a deep moral responsibility. Martin Luther King Jr. said that boycott at a very basic level is withdrawing support for an evil system or policy. So it's not a heroic act. Stopping your, your partnership in crime is not heroic. It's a basic moral obligation. When we ask the United Methodist Church to divest from companies that are enabling the occupation, we're not asking them to do something heroic. We're asking them to fulfill a basic moral obligation. And that's how we should view things. So we challenge Jabotinsky's iron wall and all the other iron walls, metaphorical or real, with hope based on action hope based on reflection, hope based on resistance to oppression. To end, I'll cite a poem 
called Message to the Living by Henk van Radvik, a Dutch poet of resistance against the German occupation of World War II of the Netherlands. He wrote, a people giving in to tyrants will lose more than body and goods. The light will be extinguished, end of quote. On Sunday, September 14, 2014, a few weeks after the end of Israel's massacre in Gaza, and despite all the death, destruction, and trauma, hundreds of thousands of Gaza's children almost literally rose from under the rubble that much of Gaza was reduced to and went with enthusiasm to their damaged schools, carrying their dusty books and injured souls. Their eyes were shining with hope for a dignified life. BDS empowers Palestinians and worldwide supporters of a just peace to keep this hope alight. Thank you. In a nutshell, Palestinian, uh, the Palestinian BDS movement defines normalization as any relationship between a Palestinian slash Arab side and an Israeli side where two conditions are not met. When the Israeli side does not recognize our rights under international law, our comprehensive rights under international law, uh, or the relationship itself is not one of what we call co-resistance. In other words, the Israeli side has to recognize our rights and the relationship has to be joint struggle to end oppression. It's, it's not enough that they recognize our rights, it's important to work to end oppression. Uh, any dialogue that does not have those two conditions is unethical dialogue. It's a dialogue between a master and a slave, oppressor and oppressed, to make oppression look more palatable. And we oppose that as unethical. We want ethical coexistence, which can only be built after ending oppression, not despite oppression. Uh, BDS supporters not supporting BDS goals, that's, that's not possible. Uh, um, they wouldn't be BDS supporters. Uh, BDS supporters choosing to target a specific, very selective target, that's one thing, which is we're fine with, because BDS is based on context sensitivity, which means activists in any context decide what best to target, how best to form alliances against that target. But one thing is not negotiable, the three basic rights ending the occupation, ending the racial discrimination, and the right of return. That is not up for discussion, because those are our minimum rights that the Palestinian people are entitled to. Um, the Jewish state issue, I'll, I'll just go very briefly on that. Uh, if Israel, in fact, adopts this law that, that uh, looks at itself as a Jewish state, it would be furthering entrenching its apartheid status. So Israel would be passing yet another very important law that drops the very last mask of democracy. Uh, ISIS, the Islamic State, uh, ISIL, other names, um, we think that the US and Israel are benefiting a lot from this ISIS phenomenon. Uh, regardless, regardless whether Hillary Clinton was accurate or not, that the US intelligence community created the beginnings of ISIS. Well, they created Taliban, they created Al-Qaeda. So why not ISIS? I mean, after all, who created bin Laden? It was the US in Afghanistan. So that, that's history. Uh, regardless, we don't have conclusive evidence. Regardless, who's benefiting from ISIS? One thing is for sure, that tens of thousands of victims of ISIS are brown Muslim Arabs, predominantly. We are the main victims of this genocidal violence that ISIS is committing. No one in the right mind in our region supports this, this uh, abominable uh, uh, um, savagery. That ISIS. BDS is based on strategizing, prioritizing, picking a specific target. Uh, uh, there are three criteria for picking a target. First, the level of complicity. The more complicit it is, the easier it is to target it. Second, intersectionality. It's, it's better to target something that offends several communities. So G4S is involved in private, private prisons in this country, the wall with Mexico, as well as Israel's 
uh, prisons and, and checkpoints, perfect target. Something that, that violates indigenous rights in this, country, uh, in this country as well as Palestine, perfect target. So that's the second, intersectionality. The third is the possibility of success. We're not romantic activists. We want success. We only do it in order to achieve our rights. So we don't do it for fun. Sometimes it is fun, but we don't do it for fun. We do it to achieve our three basic rights, and that's why we have to keep our eyes on the ball. Can we win this campaign? If we can't, we keep it for a better day. Example, Intel. Intel is deeply complicit. We cannot win against Intel because it's nearly a monopoly. We're, it's not off the hook, but we keep it for a better day. We target companies that we can win, build momentum, and move on. Um, Hani's question about the implications of equality for Palestinians uh, uh, on U.S. interests. Uh, thank you so much, Hani, for asking this question, because there is no U.S. interests. Let's define it. Is it the 1% or the rest? For the 1%, U.S. interests are the interests of oil companies, military companies, homeland security, banks, and so on. Certainly, Israel serves their interests. When people say Israel is good for America, it is for the 1%. For the 99%, Israel is horrible. It starts a war every couple of years, Israel showers it with billions of dollars, and so on and so forth. So which America are we talking about? So it's not exactly that Israel is running US foreign policy. Some very powerful people in the US want Israel because it's serving their interest, but it's not the interest of the people.